we're going to look in extension at what the treatment of these zones by companies actually looks like and the way that you force the social lifestyles and the actual lives of women to be disrupted by the establishment of these zones. That's going to constitute a couple of things. First, I'm going to look at in particular why the problems they exist, exist say, say exist, do exist, how the treatment of those zones will be really problematic and the economic opportunities that exist do nothing to claim back the power that they say men have. And second, I'm going to look at why this abandons a series of ideological battles for feminism and for women, and in doing so also abandons the people they apparently care about, which is the least advantaged women. We're going to argue why it's ridiculous to say those women aren't having opportunities, that is to say, exploited at the moment. So, what do we think that this actually looks like? The first thing I'm going to explain is what we think a realistic alternative looks like. Because it is true there is a path to progress, but what does improving that path look like? Number one, it looks like using the enormous amount of capital the state diverts to women now to do things like offer companies incentives to hire women, not just affirmative action. So they get a benefit from having women within existing corporate structures, that is to say, not making businesses now entirely male spaces, which we think is a problematic thing. Number two, we say you have education and scholarships and offer those incentives in the same way many Western countries do now with things like disability advocates to say that those jobs can be valuable for people and that the company itself gets a benefit from that. Notably, that is a path to improve change. Lastly, Madam Speaker, we say this looks like the change of culture that happened in Japan at the moment, where you see that the dominant male culture of business culture has failed that country, and where that economic failure is widespread and affects men, and not just women who experience failure in these special zones, that men then have an incentive to do something about it as they are at the moment. Special economic zones in Japan like that just put exacerbated failure on zones of women who have less experience and skills, and allow men to point to women subsequently as the reason for the failure of that economics more generally. We think that is the problem. Yeah. Second, what do these zones actually look like? Because the case of government relies on this generating a lot of capital and that capital being well distributed between women. Notably, they said this was particularly important for really disadvantaged women. What does this actually look like? Number one, you force the separation of women and men in everyday lives because it's stupid to say that men can live and buy things in these zones when the reality is that you have to work in vastly physically separate areas. So you separate families and men and women. If that family unit or just living with other people who are not of your gender is important to you, you have, those people are no longer going into those zones. Number two, they don't change the dominant in corporate culture and of economic power of men because they admitted that most companies are owned by men. But we don't think that particularly changes. You just exploit women by companies that are owned in that way by men and entrench that power more for the companies that have a dominant position in the market than you do for individual women who at best get marginally more positions than they otherwise would, especially when the trend is increasing towards them getting more of those executive positions or basic positions. Three, what do special economic zones in particular look like in this sense? It looks like the exploitation of excess labour by companies like Foxconn in China to, to exert their economic power and exploit people within those zones, and notably to excuse that exploitation by saying it is a separate economic zone and that economic policy is different. And in this case, directed by women, so if it fails, which they have to admit is at least somewhat of a possibility, if it fails, you point to the failure of women to economically be able to look after themselves, as opposed to at the moment, pointing to the failure of men to integrate them into that culture. That's the worst possible thing they can talk about. Second point of extension, how this loses a series of ideological battles for women and for feminism. Because notably, they're also talking about modernised, developed countries that have relatively good economic participation of women. So at what point then, what battles are we talking about? Number one, we say there is a battle to be had by most of feminism to say that the economic system as it exists is masculine and will be masculine and there is a right of women to reject that system and to have roles in things like housework but also roles in things like their family or in more active social and community participation as being a more meaningful role. We think this focuses economic participation as a solution but notably it also focuses the capital that these countries have, especially developing countries, for encouraging encouraging women's participation or policies like allowing poor people to access services on that problem and on incentivizing special economic zones so it makes it all the more difficult to advocate yeah. for different solutions. Let's say 
Things like contraception for the women who will remain poor under your system, regardless of where they get those jobs from, because there will always be that underclass. What? No. Second, you characterise women's economic participation as aggressive and as different, and you characterise it as looking different and special, because that's exactly what you said. You wanted these policies to look very different. You wanted the economic zone to look different. What that speaks to men is to say that women are fundamentally different from you, and their integration into your business culture for a large number of women who can't participate in these zones is something that you should be fearful of, or in some way worry about being different from you. We think that's the worst possible way to win that battle. Lastly, in this point, you set back internal policies that matter for most women. Notably, because departments, if there are requirements for them to hire women, can hire them in those special economic zones. But also because you, you remove the market incentive to punish companies that actually are sexist because you say that they can just operate in these zones. I'll take poison. In countries that we actually raise where hiring practices actively discriminate against women, do you increase not only educational incentives, but also CD opportunities to engage more with mainstream? The majority of those opportunities don't change in number. We think you transfer minimal opportunities all over the country into one zone, which isn't beneficial. And the second point I'll make here is that that empowerment is not meaningful when it doesn't transfer, which it doesn't, because you make these women's participation a special participation and not one that has been done in the general economic frontiers most people are familiar with. So it means that those credentials don't actually transfer, and notably that men don't see women participating. We also don't buy that there will be increased economic benefit in these zones rather than exploitation of those women's labour, who is apparently starting off from a less skilled position. And if you believe there are reasons that this is a problem, there are intense attitudes that are discriminatory that say you should treat women less well. Lastly, on the least advantaged women, it is a lie to pretend that poor women are not put into jobs at the moment, especially notably when you're talking about garment factories. What then do we think is notable? They're not promoting the empowerment of those women, they just have different people in charge of their exploitation. We don't think women are less likely to do that. Notably, you don't stop discrimination on pregnancy, guys, because some people say they're just not going to get pregnant, so that discrimination exists. But those women in those positions have less economic power and demand on the state, and you tell them that their role belongs with other women and not with men or with any other role in society. Their own economic power is in their hands, and if they fail, that's their problem. That's what you tell women, that's what you tell that society, that's why we're proud to oppose.